chapter 8 this morning. If you don't have a Bible, we do encourage you to use one that's there in the pew. Uh, Please take one of those and turn with us to Isaiah 8, and that can be found on page 605, 605 in the pew Bible, Isaiah 8, and will mostly be, in fact, I think all the scriptures we're going to turn to today will be in Isaiah, and so uh, we should be able to kind of stay in that same area in your Bible today. It is obviously Christmas time, and so it it behooves us to spend some time this month speaking of the subject of Christmas, and uh, this year as I considered and prayed what the Lord would have us to examine during this time on Sunday mornings, um, I thought about how the Israelites, the Jews, and really the whole world uh, came to the time of Christ being born, and what all led up to that. And what it was like before Jesus was here. And uh, the title of our series is Come Thou Dayspring, which is a little phrase borrowed from the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And I think it sums up really what Christmas is about. Dayspring is the first light of the morning uh, after the darkness of night and the long, cold night. When the day spring comes, when the sun rises and uh, there, there begins to be warmth and life and, and fear is washed out and all these things. Um, so the, the title of the whole series is Come Thou Day Spring. And then each week we'll look at one different aspect of the time leading up to Christ's birth. And so uh, this morning, it, uh, a beautiful day out, uh, sun shining and, and we've got all kinds of, uh, it's, it's unseasonably warm here in Cincinnati, so it's kind of an odd time to speak of this, but today we're going to talk about darkness. Darkness. Because that's what was before Christ came into this world. Darkness. And so as we examine today, we need to keep in mind that uh, there is hope, Christ has come, and, and, and we'll get to that later on, but I want us to kind of get a feel of where these people were and really where all of our, us are at times in our lives when we're waiting for God to do something in our life. And so we're going to look at this subject of darkness, the time leading up to Christ's birth. Why is darkness so intimidating? I remember we took the teens when, uh, when I was a youth director, we took the teens to Chattanooga one year for a summer retreat. And one of the activities we did was uh, we went to Ruby Falls. And you know how that you go down into the cave and you wind yourself down into the cave and, and um, you finally get to the bottom there where the falls are and they turn all of the lights out for a moment just so you can get an idea of what it feels like to be in total darkness. Most of us, we're not usually in total darkness. Even when we sleep, we've got some kind of light somewhere coming in. But I'll tell you, and if you've ever experienced total darkness for any period of time, you know that even just for the few seconds they turn those lights out, it is pretty intimidating. Darkness can be felt. Darkness can bring uh, fear uh, to our hearts, just the presence of not knowing what's around you. Uh, Especially when you're in charge of many teenagers and they turn all the lights out and you're wondering what in the world is happening. Is somebody going to be hanging off a stalag? Which one's hanging down? Tight or might? Tight, stalag tights. You know, somebody going to be swinging from a stalactite or, you know, uh, you never know with teenagers. But darkness is intimidating. You know, in darkness, the way out could be right in front of you and you have no idea because it's completely dark. Something very dangerous could be one step away from you and you'd be completely unaware. Darkness is chilling. It's frightening. And it offers cover for those who would do wrong. Darkness is not something most of us look forward to. Darkness is intimidating. Now, before the birth of Jesus, the nation of Israel, really the whole world, was in complete and utter darkness in every way. Physically, they were in real slavery. They were under Roman rule at the moment of Christ coming into this world. But even even before that, many, many years in bondage to different nations. Israel was in real slavery before Christ came. Spiritually, they were in darkness. Uh, They were under religious subordination to the law and rabbinical rules. 
They didn't just have the law of Moses to keep. They had the many other traditions and rules and add-ons that the rabbis had put on top of the law to keep. These people were in spiritual darkness because they were bound to a law that they could not keep. Spiritually also, they were having relational silence from God. From between the books of Malachi and Matthew in your Bible, there's probably just one page or maybe even zero. But in between those two books in the Bible, between Malachi and John the Baptist, 400 years of time goes by where God does not speak to the nation of Israel through any prophetic word whatsoever. So they were having relational silence. Darkness was all around them, physically in bondage to other nations. They were in bondage to the law. They had the burden of carrying the law, and they had the silence from God. Darkness was just completely surrounding and had baptized the nation of Israel at this time. This morning in Sunday school class, we began going through a series uh, called Experiencing Christmas, and and, um, we saw a, a portion of a video that depicts how uh, we got to the birth of Christ. And one of the quotes, I'm going to steal it. Um, the guy used in the video, he stole it from C.S. Lewis, so I think it's fair game. Uh, but if you've ever seen the movie The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, how many have seen that? Fantastic, or read the book, right? The book's better, okay. If you've read the book or seen the movie, you, you know kind of the, the, the idea of that movie. And there's a portion in that movie where one of the girls says... Uh, that the, the white witch has cast a curse over all of Narnia. And so, here's her quote. It's always winter, but never Christmas. It's always winter, but never Christmas. And I think that's a perfect way to describe what Israel was experiencing before Jesus Christ came. It was always winter, always cold, always dark but never Christmas, never the celebration of God's gift, of God giving and God providing. And they weren't experiencing that in this time of darkness. Now, just like this period in Israeli history, as individuals, we can experience complete darkness at times in our lives. There's times when the darkness seemingly outweighs the hope in our life. And we could go through the the myriad of different Uh, darknesses that a human life can go through. We've all experienced those days of darkness in our lives. But thanks be to God, light has come in the form of Jesus Christ. But maybe this morning you're in one of those times in your life where you're experiencing darkness yourself. You're in one of those times where it's really hard to find joy anywhere. Even though it's Christmas and you love the songs and you love the season, you're really not experiencing the Savior. You're really not experiencing the blessings that you maybe think are due. And so this morning, as we look at what Israel was going through, I believe we'll be able to see a little bit at times in our life, and truthfully, if you haven't been born again, you're still in these times of darkness, but light has come. So let's look at the Word of God today. Uh, Isaiah chapter 8, we're going to read just one verse. It's the final verse of the chapter, Isaiah 8.22. This kind of describes where Israel is, the Jews are, before Jesus. Isaiah 8.22. And they shall look unto the earth, and behold, trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. This is what Israel was experiencing before Christ. Let's pray this morning. Father, we are grateful to be in your house. And Lord, as we celebrate the season of you sending your only begotten son to this earth, we are thankful today. We are grateful for the the gift that we could never, ever completely understand. But Lord, we come this morning thankful for Jesus. Lord, as we look at your word this morning and we consider darkness before Christ, I pray if there's someone here who's not saved, that they're in this darkness right now. Their soul is spiritually dark. Their spirit is spiritually dead. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak to their heart in a very powerful way. And, God, that you would convict them of their sin and their need for a Savior. And that today, 
this very hour they would trust Christ as their Savior. Because light has come through Jesus. And Lord, for those who know you, who may be having a season of darkness in their lives, I pray that you would um, shine in our hearts the, the glorious hope that is in Christ and the promises that are in your word. I pray that as we leave this place, we'll understand that darkness is real, but we'll know that the light of God is greater. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we consider in Isaiah uh, 8.22 this morning, the state of Israel, the state of the Jews, that really of the whole world, they just didn't realize it at that time. It says, And they shall look into the earth, and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Now what I find fascinating about that verse is what it precedes. Now if you know uh, about Isaiah chapter 9, you know that in verses 6 and 7, it tells us about Jesus Christ. And for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. It tells about Christ coming. And so it precedes, the darkness precedes the glorious light of Jesus Christ, even in the word of God here in Isaiah's prophecy. But Israel is in real darkness. I wonder today, are you experiencing darkness? Now what I'd like for us to do is turn a couple pages to the right to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. And we're going to look at this physical darkness that Israel was in. Physical darkness, bondage and slavery that they were going through at these times. Isaiah 59, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. So here's a promise from God. He's aware and he's able. And he's listening for the cry of his people. Now, if we skip down to verses 9 and 10, watch this. Isaiah 59, 9. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind. And we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. The testimony of Israel before Christ. The testimony of any of us before Christ. We try to go through this life and without Jesus, it doesn't work. The Christian life for those who are saved, it is impossible outside of Jesus Christ living through us. And so we understand we desperately need light. Israel was experiencing real slavery, as we saw here. Think about back in Exodus. Now, you don't need to turn to these passages. You can write them down if you want. You can turn if you'd like, but we're not going to read them. Exodus 1.14. The, the, the children of Israel were in bondage to Egypt. A long time of bondage before God brought them out through Moses the Deliverer. Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. They were brought in captivity to the Babylonians. It was all a part of God's plan. They were brought into captivity by the Babylonians. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, the leadership, the ruling of the world changes hands from uh, the Babylonians to the Persians. And now they're under the hands, the ruling of the Persians. The Seleucid area, uh, era. It's extra biblical, but historically, it's that time where Israel was actually independent for about a hundred years. But it went so poorly that they sought outside help. And here come the Romans. The Romans came and they ruled the entire known world at this time. All of these things show us the bondage and the captivity that the children of Israel were experiencing physical slavery on this earth. And the word we use most of the time for that is bondage. You know what bondage does? When we're bound to an authority of another, it helps us to realize our, our dependence on God. That we can't do it on our own. We need a Savior. If I'm bound and I need to be released, I need a Savior to come. And Israel knew they needed a Savior. They knew there were promises about a Savior. From the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3, there was a promise about a Savior that would release them from the curse of sin. 
And so they knew that there was a Savior coming. But at this time, he had not come. It says they were waiting in verses 9 and 10 of Isaiah 59. I wonder this morning, are you bound by your sin? See, Israel was in physical bondage to other nations. It was a dark time for them. I wonder this morning, have you come into this room bound in sin? What do I mean by that? You've never been set free. You see, when we're born into this world, how many of you have been born? Raise your hand. <laughs> when we're born into this world, we inherit uh, the nature from Adam. And his nature is a sin nature. So every human that's ever born into this world, we inherit that sin nature. And so we're born with a nature, a human, sinful, fleshly nature. And that's all we've got when we start out. We're born in sin. We have a sin nature. All we know is sin. We're bound in that sin. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ... Jesus made the way for us to be freed from our bondage in sin. Because when you trust Christ as your Savior, what you receive is a new nature. The old one doesn't go away. It's still there. You just add another one. And it's a new nature. The Spirit of God Himself comes to live within you. And so now you have two natures warring within you. What I want to do and what God wants me to do. And they're constantly fighting, aren't they? Boy, we experience it every day, don't we? What I want to do, what God wants me to do. And we live with those two natures. But here's the wonderful thing about the second nature. When you get born again and you receive your spiritual nature, you don't have to sin anymore because Christ lives in you. And if we reckon, the Bible says, or if we account that our flesh, our sin nature is dead, I hope this isn't the case. But have you ever felt about someone, have you ever said this about someone, they're dead to me? Or maybe you've heard someone say that about somebody, that person is dead to me. What we mean by that is, I'm going to act like they don't even, they're not even alive. To me, they don't exist. To me, that person I'm not, going to give them the, I'm not going to acknowledge that they're even on this earth. You know, the Bible says that's what we should do with our flesh. <laughs> we should look at our sin nature as being dead to us. I'm not even going to acknowledge it. As far as I'm concerned, it's not even here anymore. The only thing I'm going to pay attention to is God's spirit. That's the way God intends it for us to, to live as Christians. So he frees us from the bondage of sin now that we can live a new life. Through Christ, because of Jesus. Darkness to light. Jesus can deliver you from darkness. Maybe today you're here and you're not born again. Today would be a great day to trust Christ. Get that new nature where you have Christ living within you. Then you'll have the promise of heaven as your home. You'll have the promise of God with you at every moment of every day. Would you be saved today? Leave that darkness and come to Christ. All the world was waiting. Israel especially was waiting for the Messiah and they were in physical bondage. But then we also know this, they were in spiritual darkness as well. They were in physical darkness, bondage to other nations, foreign nations, and we also know spiritually they were in darkness. They were religiously subordinate to the law. They had this law, the law of Moses, that they were trying to keep. And they, as we understand, they had the rabbis would add on top of these laws further stipulations that they had to try to keep in order to remain right with God and hold up his word. They were subordinate to the law. The Bible tells us that we are to live by faith. As we see in, in the very beginning in Genesis, Abraham, the Bible says, lived by faith. Abraham had faith, and that was accounted to him for righteousness. It tells us that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that we are to live by faith, not by sight, not by works. That's the ideal way to live is by faith, because the law is burdensome. You know, faith, though, when we have faith, you know what it'll do? Faith will breed works. 
If I have faith in God and it's real in my heart, it will cause me to action. It will move me to action. I won't even have to think about it because my faith will make me do things. What is on the inside will work its way out. Faith breeds works. That's the proper order. The Bible says faith without works is dead. Faith is supposed to cause us to do something, not the other way around. We don't work our way into heaven. We trust Christ for the work he's done, and that faith in us works out of us. That's the way that God wants it to be. Works, though. Works without faith breeds ritual. These people were in a dark place. Because they were doing all of the right things. But their heart was far from God. They weren't doing it by faith. They were doing it by ritual. By duty. By what they were supposed to do. And you know what ritual uh, works without faith breeds ritual. And you know what ritual breeds? Idolatry. Idolatry is more about doing and not being. Idolatry is more about pleasing myself or someone else. That's idolatry. And that's where these people were. For crying out loud, they were worshiping a brass snake. These people were idolaters. They took on the gods from other nations and they were worshiping, idolizing, ritual for the sake of ritual. God becomes secondary when we're only doing things because we do them. And ultimately, idolatry breeds confusion. Turn with me to Isaiah 41 and we'll see this. Idolatry breeds confusion. And that's why we see a lot of Christian people in the world today who really don't know why they do what they do. Because they're just doing, not being. Look at Isaiah 41, verse 29. It says, Behold, they are all vanity. Their works are nothing. Their molten images are wind and confusion. Idolatry brings confusion. Turn over a couple pages to chapter 45, verse 16. Isaiah 45, 16. It says, They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. Idolatry breeds confusion. Idolatry, ritual, Works without faith. Doing things because that's why. Because I'm supposed to. Doing things because that's what I've always done. Doing things because that's what so-and-so has always said. That brings confusion to us. And the problem we get into, the confusion comes because I have a problem discerning whether it's God telling me to do that or it's man telling me to do that. Is it my desire or God's desire? And the people of Israel were experiencing this and all the rabbinical rules. They were, when Jesus came, one of the problems he had with the religious leaders is that they were teaching traditions as though it was scripture. And he said, quit it. And that's the reason people listened to Jesus. They said, he spoke as one with authority and not like the Pharisees. What did they mean by that? He wasn't teaching some tradition of man. He was teaching and saying the very word of God. And how wonderful is it when you hear the word of God given in power versus just somebody's idea of of life and and, and psycho talk and all these things. You see, darkness was there. Spiritually, they were in darkness because they were subordinate to the law and the traditions of man. And this brings a burden spiritually. Law and confusion brings a burden And it forces us to acknowledge our dependence on God's grace. I've used this story before, but it really is 
sunk into my heart today, so I'm going to tell it to you. About a year ago, a month, ago, a year and a half ago, we were out knocking on doors. And we came up to a yard where there was a man and a woman working in their front yard. And after a few minutes of conversation, we found out that they were Jewish people. And we began to talk about the different festivals and the, the things of the Jews. And I remember talking about how, you know, when you look at the different, like the Passover, you can see Jesus so well in all these festivals. And the lady, I'll never forget the look on her face as long as I live. She looked up at me and she goes, the law is just so hard to keep. And I wish, you could, I wish I could have, I wish you could see the expression on her face when she said this. Because you saw a woman who was burdened with trying to please God by her works. My heart goes out to those folks. Because they, they haven't, they still have the blinders on. They haven't seen that light has come. The law doesn't save us. The law helps us to realize just what she said. I can't do it. I can't do what Moses said to do. It's impossible. That's correct. But the good news is, Jesus fulfilled the law. When he died on the cross, he took care of sin for any who will believe on him. Light has come. Israel was in darkness because they were burdened by the law. But what Jesus provided when he died was the work of salvation. And we can come to him by faith. If you're in Isaiah 45, look at verse 22. It says, Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. One way. How do I be saved? Look unto him. One way. Finally, Israel was in relational darkness to God. Silence for 400 years. 400 years of not getting a prophecy from God. From Malachi to John the Baptist, nothing. Utter silence. You know what that means? That means no personal message from God. No timely word. No reminders of God's love and faithfulness. There was no direction given by God fresh in those days. No fresh promises given by God for 400 years. Relational silence weren't hearing from God. God was not giving them a fresh prophecy. The blessing that you and I have is we have God's ever-living fresh prophecy right in our hands. We have the privilege of having God's word. And I think it was Miss Heather said at our uh, Thanksgiving service, if you want to hear God speak, read the Bible. If you want to hear him speak audibly, read the Bible out loud. Because he's still speaking through this word. No more silence from God. We have a whole book with His Word given to us. And we can hear it any time we want to. But when we neglect it, it's darkness. Darkness seeps in. And when that relationship with God, that the only way we can keep a relationship right in any way is communication. If communication breaks down, so do relationships. So if I stop communicating with God and Him with me, that's going to break down. Fellowship's going to be poor. Me and God aren't going to be walking close together. And that's darkness. And we start subbing, substituting, doing things instead of being in that close relationship with God. And you know what that brings? That brings burnout and backsliding. Because I'm, starting, I'm trying to do without having a real closeness to God. And these people had no word from God. Silence. Longing for the day to come when the Messiah would come. But he had not come yet. Silence and backsliding forces us to acknowledge our dependence on God's personal involvement in our lives. You know, drifting is easy when you're not communicating. It's easy to drift from your marriage partner, from a family member, co-workers it's easy to drift apart when you're not communicating regularly and God had not sent a fresh word for 400 years but I love how John chapter 1 puts it in the beginning was the word 
and the word was God, and the word was with God. What came when Jesus came? A fresh word. The very word of God. Light has come. Light has come. These people were in darkness before Christ. You and I are personally in darkness before Christ. And even when we have Christ, we can get into moments of personal darkness when we drift from him. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Light has come. He has come and light has been in this world. God with us, Emmanuel, what we sang about this morning. God with us. What an awesome thought. God with us. This morning, have you been born again? Is he with you? If you'd stand with me, please, and our musicians would come. We'll have a time of invitation. Today we have seen that darkness is very real. Darkness is real. But light has come. I wonder this morning, have you responded to the light that God has given you? Have you responded to Jesus Have you responded to his spirit that speaks to your heart and says, trust me, receive me as your savior? Have you responded to that? Light doesn't do us any good if we don't accept it. Don't remain in darkness today. If you need to be saved, do what it said in Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be saved. Look unto Jesus. Be saved this morning. Where are you, Christian? How's your walk? Have you drifted? You know, today is a good day to decide, I'm done drifting, Lord. I'm going to get into your word. I'm going to pray. And I want to hear from you. This is a great season. A great season to make things right with God. And before we get into it full swing, we're right at the beginning of December. I can't think of a better way to enter the Christmas season by refreshing and renewing, perhaps, that fellowship with God. As our folks sing, let's all do business with God this morning.